Hello. Um, you can tell from my voice that I'm a little bit poorly. I've got a bit of an infection on my larynx and mucus and all that sort of thing. Look at my dedication to you guys and chucking out a video onto the YouTubes every week. Um, anywho, I've got my friend here and he's turned around so his posterior is towards you. Um, and the aim of this week's video is to talk about the vertebrae of the back. Now we've talked about the parts of the vertebrae of the back in the past, but somebody said, can you look at the differences between the vertebrae? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at the different vertebrae. So I've got a bunch of individual vertebrae down here, which all look very different, and yet they're all vertebrae from the same vertebral column. So the aim is for you guys afterwards to be able to pick out very easily a vertebra and say which part of the vertebral column it comes from and why. All right, so there are about 33 vertebrae. How many have you got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 33. Most people got back 33 or 34. And we have cervical or cervical vertebrae. So we've got seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, five sacral vertebrae, which are all fused together into the sacrum. And then we've got these little coccygeal vertebrae down here, these little guys. Um, and the first one often isn't fused to the rest of them. The rest of them are little diddy ones, and that's what forms the tailbone. Um, and it's there that the variation occurs. There's maybe, there's maybe three or four coccygeal bones, so hence why the number of uh, vertebrae might vary a little bit. Um, and just looking at the length of the skeleton here, I think you can see that they look different from here, right? And if you want to find out how <coughs> this sort of thing affects my running, I'll probably mention that in the vlog this week. Um, you know, one thing I like to do is, <laughs> one thing I like to do is um, the human vertebrae are very similar to the vertebrae of lots of other animals. I mean, for example, do you know how many cervical vertebrae a giraffe has? Google it, if you don't know. <laughs> How many do you reckon? Um, but I mean, like, I, I love sitting in the Natural History Museum and looking at fossilized remains of dinosaurs. And you look at the dinosaurs, which were around a little while ago, and um, the shapes of their, they've got a lot of vertebrae, some of them, they've got, they got a lot of vertebrae. Um, but the shape is very familiar. It's very similar, it's amazing. Um, okay, so what about humans then? Now clearly, <laughs> You could spend hours and hours and hours talking about the osteology of the vertebrae and the various differences because there's a lot, there's a lot of bony stuff going on here. So we've got to be a little bit specific and uh, keep ourselves to the big, the, the big differences. Now we're going to talk mostly about the cervical vertebrae because they've got a lot of differences and the others are a bit more straightforward, right? For example, if you look up here, so we've got two very different vertebrae, C1 and C2. So C1 is the atlas. And C1 then is supporting the occipital bone there. So it's got some, a big articulating surface there to support the weight of the skull. The other really obvious thing is that it doesn't have a body. So this is the body of the vertebra. The, uh, the atlas, the C1, does, doesn't have a body. Also, it doesn't have a spinous process, right? So it's, quite, it's a very, very weird one. It's got a very large hole because it's going to take this bony process from C2. Um, so instead of having a body, it's actually got a gap for this, this peg, this odontoid process. So it's actually got, um, it's got two, it's got big articulating surfaces on both sides. So on one side, it's gonna articulate with C2, the atlas bone, and on the other side, it's gonna support the occipital bone, right? And instead of having a body, it's got a big hole to take the odontoid peg, or the dens, or the peg, from the atlas, from the C2 bone, and then it can spin around it, which gives you that. There's loads of rotation in the neck, loads more than elsewhere in the body, in the, in the vertebral column. The thorax is pretty good, but the neck is, is the best. Um, and it does have transverse processes, and it does have foramen in the transverse processes, just like 
the transverse processes of all the other cervical vertebrae, which we'll talk about as we go through, right? So that's C1, the atlas, looks weird, no body. C2 also looks weird because of this odontoid peg, right? Sticking up here. Um, but it does have a body, the peg is part of the body. Um, it's got kind of minimal transverse processes, it's got a spinous process, um, and it's got a pretty large vertebral foramen for the spinal cord to pass through. The odontoid peg then is anterior, right? Is anterior is over here, posterior is there. The spinal cord is running posterior to the odontoid peg. And that's important because if the peg fractures and gets pushed posteriorly, then it's gonna get pushed into the medulla oblongata or into the spinal cord. Um, so in the olden days, uh, you know, when you, people used to be um, executed by hanging, I remember seeing lots of films, right, where to save them the, the agony of hanging to death, family members or friends would run and grab their ankles, right? And what that would do would be break the odontoid peg off, which would crush the spinal cord and kill them quickly, hopefully. Horrible, isn't it? Very grim. Um, so that's C1 and C2. I, I like how I can pick these up and go straight to them because I can recognize all the features. This is then kind of your typical cervical vertebra. Now look, it's got a really, really long spinous process, but the thing that draws me to it are these two foramen in the transverse processes. Because up in the neck here, we have the vertebral arteries um, running up within the transverse foramina on either side to get up to foramen magnum and get inside the skull. So that's a distinctive feature of the cervical vertebrae, a foramen on either side within the transverse processes. So these are the transverse, this is a transverse foramen. These are transverse foramina, right? Um, now, the body is small because this vertebra is not supporting a lot of weight and the vertebral foramen is large because at these levels, we, we're gonna have the brachial plexus and all the nerves going to the upper limbs, right? So um, there's, there's a lot of gray matter there. There's a lot of connections for the brachial plexus. So the spinal cord is really, really thick at the cervical levels. So there's a large vertebral foramen as well. Now the other thing, well, there's two other things really, right? One thing, all right, take your finger, up at the back of your neck and you can feel that big bony lump, can't you? At the back of the level of the shirt collar, top of the neck, that big bony lump is the spinous process of C7. So these spinous processes are really horizontal, really sticky outy, um, and that's that really prominent one there. The other thing is in, in, you, these vertebrae may or may not have bifid spinous processes, that is the bone does that at the end, forms a little V shape or a little Y shape. Sometimes that's there, sometimes that's not, but that's also a cervical vertebrae thing, right? So you can easily recognize a cervical vertebrae. C1 looks weird, C2's got his peg, and then the rest of the cervical vertebrae down to, down to seven, got a little body and these holes in the transverse processes. Easy peasy, right? Okay, next, the, um, the vertebrae at the level of the rib, so the thoracic vertebrae. And that's important, that we've done a rib video and we talked about how the ribs articulate with the vertebrae, I'm sure we did. And that's the distinguishing feature of these guys, is that each rib will articulate with the ribs at three points. So the ribs are a little bit out of phase with the vertebrae, um, in that a rib will articulate, so um, bum, bum, bum. Here's your, your thoracic vertebra there. Now they've got articular processes, so adjacent vertebrae can articulate with each other, right? But then they've also got an articular process on the transverse, an, an articular facet rather, on the transverse process for the rib as it comes out. And also the rib is gonna articulate with the inferior bit of the body of one vertebra and the superior bit of the vertebral body of the vertebra next to it. Does that make sense? So the, if you've got the ribs are like half a step out of phase with the vertebrae, so that one rib will articulate with two vertebrae and the transverse process as it goes out. And that, that allows for a little bit of rotation of the rib at this point, which causes the, the rib to move like that, the bucket handle movement and what have you, right? So that's one thing you can look for. Again, the body is quite small, 
The vertebral foramen is nothing to write home about. It's not huge, but the vertebral body, look, it's often heart-shaped. That's distinctive, right? It's got this heart shape to it. And look, the spinous process runs really kind of posterior, really inferiorly and posteriorly. It's really angled down. So you notice how the top few are not so severe and then this gets more severe as we go down and a little bit less severe as we get to the end. So they're all a little bit different again, but essentially for most of the thoracic vertebrae, they have these very vertical spinous processes which are overlapping with the inferior vertebrae. So that's a notable feature, right? See how that looks quite distinctive? Um, so for a thoracic vertebrae, you're looking for articular facets that the ribs can articulate with. Best place to look, in my opinion, is the transverse process because it stands out a little bit. You've got heart-shaped body and you've got these, often these, these long vertical-ish spinous processes, all right? Next, that's thoracic done, the five lumbar vertebrae. Now, the, the thing about the lumbar vertebrae is they've got really big vertebral bodies. These guys are taking all of the weight, so they've got to have big vertebral bodies to withstand a lot more weight. When we get down to the sacrum, most of that weight has been transferred to the pelvis and the lower limbs, it's gone. So it's these five vertebral, uh, these five lumbar vertebrae which are taking a lot of the load of the bodies. They've got, they got big vertebral bodies. The, trans, the, uh, the processes then, right? These are kind of short, stubby. They're not as slender and elegant as the others. They're really, really strong for all the muscles. We've done the videos of the deep, 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 deep muscles of the back, right? There are a lot of muscles attaching to these vertebrae. So they've got, they've got really, really strong, hopefully, stubby spinous processes, which are now more horizontal again. And they've got, um, whereas, the, uh, whereas the transverse processes at the thoracic level kind of you know, short, but a little bit special. These guys are kind of slender and sticking out laterally. But the main thing is that large vertebral body. That's what really makes the lumbar vertebrae stand out. Look, I mean, it's, it's, it's hugely different to the other vertebrae that we've been looking at. Massive lumbar body and then kind of stubby spinous process and that sort of thing. All right, so that's those. Now with the, um, the sacrum, of course, it's very distinctive because the five sacral bones have fused together to form this very distinctive sacrum. It doesn't look like anything else. It's a very irregular bone. So the sacrum is the sacrum. It still has a vertebral foramen running down it, which is what the chorda equina, the remnants of the spinal cord are gonna run down. And it still has intervertebral foramen, or foramina, which the spinal nerves pop out of and that sort of thing. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's like these guys, it's still functional and doing its thing, it's just it's fused, right? So sacrum's easy, and then the coccyx down here is a bunch of very tiny little bones, and this first one is, is quite weirdly shaped, you know, sticky out bits and kind of big fat triangle type thing, um, whereas the others are little diddy bones which tend to fuse together to form this kind of long slender triangle. So that's the tailbone. The first one may be fused to the second one, or it might not, uh, and the first coccygeal bone might be fused to the sacrum. This might occur as you get older, it might not, you know, but that's the coccyx there. So coccyx and So as usual, structure is related to function. So you remember the function or you look at the structure and you work out, the, either way you do it, um, remember that the, these, these, um, these vertebrae are slightly different because they have slightly different jobs to do. What do you reckon? If I give you if I gave you different vertebrae now, could you tell me which level it came from? I mean, you're really, you're only asking lumbar, thoracic, or cervical, right? Sacrum is whoa, weird. Coccygeal is coccygeal, right? That was the aim, to give you a vertebra and you tell me where it comes from and maybe describe why. Cool, all right. I hope that was helpful. It wasn't too hard on my voice. I was teaching yesterday. <sighs> teaching, uh, teaching all day tomorrow, lectures a lot. <clears throat> <laughs> mm, yeah, it'd be fine. It'd be fine, right? Right, see you next week. <laughs>